Welcome back to a family historian's perspective on sense and sensibility. Quite early on, Mrs Dashwood and her daughters Eleanor, Marianne and Margaret move into Barton Cottage, which according to the novel is within four miles north of Exeter and they move there in early September. It's half a year after Mr Dashwood has died. By this point Mrs Dashwood has spent quite long enough with her stepson John and his wife Fanny who have inherited Norland, her original family home. She's just glad to move on and be somewhere where they are not. So she moves to this cottage which we're told belongs to her relation. So his name is Sir John Middleton. He lives at Barton Park. Sir John writes to Mrs Dashwood and he says that he's happy to offer Barton Cottage nearby to Mrs Dashwood and she duly leases it for a 12 month a period of 12 months, therefore a year. She isn't actually buying Barton Cottage. She's renting it. The level of detail that goes into describing Barton Park and Barton Cottage is absolutely fascinating. If, as the novel suggests, they are within four miles north of Exeter, that puts them somewhere around where Thorverton, Efford and East Raven are. So any readers of Jane Austen's novels who were familiar with those places would probably be able to picture the local landscape on the typical building style. So this is their new home. How will it be set up? That's the bit that sort of brings us back to social history a little I think. household at Norland there are clearly plenty of servants because there are enough for Mrs Dashwood to be able to select two maids and one manservant and she takes them with her when she leaves Norland and they move on to Barton Cottage. And although Mr Dashwood did leave both a carriage and some horses to his widow so he's basically leaving us on transport. Their eldest daughter, Eleanor, prudently points out that realistically they cannot afford to keep them. It, it would be a little like inheriting a car and then realising that you did not have the disposable income to tax it or insure it or maintain it or even to fill it up with fuel. In theory, and probably in practice too, Mrs Dashwood and her daughters are now essentially dependent on lifts from friends or maybe the stagecoaches and post chaises that were the Regency equivalent of public transport. They no longer have a car of their own in modern terms. But what about the practicalities of actually uprooting from Norland to Barton? It seems highly unlikely that Mrs Dashwood visited the cottage before deciding to relocate there. 
After all, it is 1797. We haven't got estate agents' windows with pictures to look at. She didn't have the internet. She wasn't checking photos and viewing 360 degree videos. She wasn't looking at floor plans. When we think about what Mrs Dashwood and her daughters are doing compared to what we do today, to move into a new home, sight unseen, is quite a leap. What will actually be waiting for her when she gets there? Because she has no idea what it's going to be like. There could be damp, the roof could be falling in, there could be anything waiting for her. By piecing together descriptions dotted throughout the novel, you can build up quite a good impression of Barton Cottage. Let us see if we can imagine Barton Cottage based on what Jane Austen tells us and try to make some deductions about how the household would have operated. Be it our ancestors may well have lived in similar circumstances themselves. It's quite possible that what Jane Austen was writing about was rooted in real life experiences. So Barton Cottage is roughly half a mile away from the big house, Barton Park. We're told that high hills rose immediately behind, so it seems to be built in a valley. A neat wicked gate admitted them into a front garden, a small green court. And in chapter 58 there is a mention of the gravel path which leads to the cottage. In chapter 9, when Willoughby rescues Marianne in the rain, he's described as passing through the garden, the gate of which had been left open by Margaret, which again seems to confirm that there is a front garden of some kind. The building is regular, so it's not a peculiar shape, it's quite an ordinary layout by the sound of it. It is comfortable and compact. It had not been built many years and was in good repair, so that's also telling us that it's a relatively new house, which is interesting. When you study the description of Sir John Middleton's Four Noisy Children, the eldest appears to be a six-year-old boy probably means that Sir John has been married for no more than seven or eight years, which actually fits because later on his wife is described as being about 26 or 27, which makes you wonder, could he have built Barton Cottage for another purpose altogether, just in case his mother-in-law, Mrs Jennings, ever decided that she wanted to move to Devon? Has he built what we might call a very luxurious granny flat. Just to dispel the romantic notions that uh, Marianne has in the book, I had a look quite carefully through the text and I suddenly realised that nowhere in the novel does it actually say that the cottage is whitewashed, which leads me to suspect that it probably wasn't supposed to be. Just to link back with the idea that the Dashwoods don't end up keeping a carriage, which they certainly don't seem to be, Eleanor says they've got to do the financially sensible thing and sell the carriage, you can also work out quite quickly that there is nowhere around Barton Cottage where they can feasibly keep a carriage or horses anyway. When Willoughby suggests that he will buy Marianne a horse in chapter 12, the unseen narrator points out that she would actually need to build a stable for it. So maybe there is enough room around Barton Cottage, but there isn't actually anything there ready and waiting to house a horse. In that sense, it's like the modern equivalent of not having a garage. If we 
go inside. A narrow passage led directly through the house into the garden. So there's a sort of central corridor in this cottage. On each side of the entrance was a sitting room about 16 feet square. That is a reasonable size room. And these sitting rooms, I think, are for the Dashwoods to entertain both guests and each other. Maybe one of these sitting rooms is actually the parlour that is mentioned in chapter 9, where Willoughby recalls meeting the family for the first time. That room is said to have a mantelpiece, which implies that there must be a fireplace, and there was also a space for several chairs. The Oxford English Dictionary defines a parlour in the domestic sense as a sitting room in a private house. It's a word with Anglo-French origins, so it's partly evolved from English, it's partly evolved from French. And parler means to speak in French. So it's where you converse, it's where you talk, it's where you entertain people. It's a room for receiving guests, for getting the conversation going. And the novel is also pretty clear that Marianne brings her piano from Norland to Barton Cottage with her. A piano would also serve to entertain guests. They didn't have television in the Regency period. They had music, they had books, they had other ways of being entertained. So it makes total sense that you would put a musical instrument into one of the parlours, that's where you're going to be entertaining guests. As for what Marianne's piano itself looked like, I imagined that it must be shaped more like what we'd call a grand piano today, not one of the upright ones, more a concert style instrument. But my research has actually shown that a more boxy, rectangular shaped piano was actually available in England, or at least in London, would be feasible to get a piano from London to Devonshire or Somerset, I think. And these sort of boxy pianos were available as early as 1766. That is probably when Mrs Dashwood is a young woman or teenager, so these box pianos had been around for quite a long time. And examples that I have found online show that they were almost like a sort of deep table or a desk not unlike a surface like this but with a, a recess in them so that the keyboard is here it's like a cut out piece and the keyboard is inserted and that's how you play it in a way it's not too dissimilar from a modern digital piano but without the electronics also present in the cottage is something else that would serve to pass the time. Eleanor has a drawing table. She brings that with her from Norland, I think, and that is installed in the cottage. It would be useful for it to be placed somewhere where there is a decent source of light coming through the windows, so maybe that's also in one of the parlours. Is there any, any extra room around this cottage? I think there actually might be, because in chapter 6, Mrs Dashwood suggests a new drawing room which may be easily added, with a bedchamber and garret above. She's planning an extension, one which in 
theory is going to allow each of their three servants a garret each. There are only two garrets in this cottage, so the two female servants, I suspect, are sharing and the male servant gets a space of his own. Also interesting to note is the existence of a breakfast room and that is where Marianne leaves Edward and Eleanor alone when he visits early on in the novel. But it is subsequently stated that Edward opens the parlour door in order to leave the cottage. So either there's a connecting door between the parlour and the breakfast room or they just use one of the parlours as a breakfast room, maybe just because it's a better size when they have guests staying. But there must be more to the cottage than the entertaining rooms, the ones that you would show your guests into. The novel tells us that beyond them, the parlours that is, were the offices and the stairs. I don't think offices is meant in our modern sense, I think it means the essential rooms. The kitchen, the larder, the pantry for storing dry goods, maybe they've got a scullery for the washing up. They may have a separate outdoor wash house, possibly, but maybe it is also more economical to just make one fire, get that burning, and heat up all the hot water together there in the kitchen and then take it to wherever you need it. Eleanor, being the practical one, does comment on the dark narrow stairs on the kitchen that smokes. So the kitchen must have a fire, it needs to have a fire, because how else are they going to cook? Which is starting to make me wonder. Have I got enough information there to be able to draw a floor plan of Bolton Cottage? Maybe I have. logical to suppose that the four bedrooms and two garrets are indeed upstairs. You may be aware that a garret is an attic or a room on the top floor of a house or other dwelling. We can deduce in this case I think that the roof space will accommodate the two maids and the one man servant who come with the family from Norland. And this is where I noticed a slight difference, as you often find, between what is said in the novel and the details in the 1995 film version. In the film, Eleanor says, we don't need four bedrooms, we can share. And indeed, you do see that Eleanor and Marianne share a room. But a film, of course, is an interpretation, and that means that there is room for a bit of artistic license. Does the novel suggest anything different to the film? Yes, it does. In chapter 25, Mrs Dashwood is really pleased when Mrs Jennings offers to take her daughters to London, because she says that will make her little plan of alteration for your bedrooms much easier to achieve. Bedrooms in the plural. Could that imply that Eleanor and Marianne normally sleep in separate rooms? On the other hand, we know that there are only four bedrooms and in chapter 8 a reference is made to buying a new grate for the spare bedchamber. Something doesn't add up there. Either Eleanor and Marianne do share a room or Margaret is sharing with her mother, that would allow a spare bedroom as well, or Mrs Dashwood is collectively describing the two rooms occupied by her three daughters, that is a possibility, or there could be another explanation.
maybe this happens in your house too the spare bedroom that's sometimes occupied maybe the dashwoods are just planning to do what many of us still do today when guests come to stay somebody in the house is going to get evicted from their room and will have to sleep with another member of the family for just a few nights it happens now maybe it happened then as well it has struck me that building up an idea of a Barton cottage is not dissimilar to my real life experience as a researcher it's often quite difficult to get the full picture looking through any of Jane Austen's novels in fact it is not particularly easy to build up a really comprehensive picture of the homes that her characters occupy often you're just working with fleeting descriptions in her work and I think that could easily transfer over to real life family history research you can certainly get an impression of what it is like to live in that fictional household that Jane Austen has created but do the details create as full a picture of the interior as some of the inventories that I've come across in my own research inventories, as I think I've mentioned before in another video are excellent because inventories are usually made after people have died taken for the purposes of estimating the value of their estate so what happens is that they die and somebody comes in and goes through their house and makes a list of everything in it that's likely to be of some kind of value or other they make an estimate of what it would sell for if it was sold and from that you can get an approximate calculation of what the estate of the deceased person is worth. When it comes to sense and sensibility, you get a similar kind of walkthrough feel when she's describing Barton Cottage to the impression that I pick up sometimes from reading an inventory. It will be divided up into different rooms and Jane Austen does describe Barton Cottage in enough detail that you can picture walking through the house right at the beginning. As a little challenge to myself, I thought maybe I could create an illustration. I decided I was going to try, just based on the description in the novel and a bit of research into surviving 18th century cottages in Devon, I was going to try to create Barton Cottage as I think it could have looked. I'm going to finish this video with a very brief glimpse of my interpretation of it. There will be another video coming up shortly about the painting in progress which is how it turned into that illustration and after that I will be looking at another family in Sense and Sensibility because I really think that we need to tackle the ferrers. They're worth talking about and there is definitely enough information in the novel to have a go at their family tree so that will be my next challenge. So please look out for that. I hope you enjoyed this video and I will be back quite soon with another one.